Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is Amory Lovins, the Rocky Mountain Institute co-founder, chairman, and chief scientist. He is a consultant, experimental physicist, educated at Harvard and Oxford. He has received an Oxford MA by virtue of being a Don, 10 honorary degrees, a MacArthur Fellowships, and numerous awards uh, from all over the world. He's an honorary member of the American Institute of Architects, foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, and honorary senior fellow of the Design Futures Council. He's lately led the redesign of over $30 billion worth of facilities in 29 sectors for radical energy and resource efficiency. He's been a visiting uh, uh, fell, a, a visiting professor at numerous universities. He's briefed 19 heads of states. The Wall Street Journal named Mr. Lovins one of 39 people worldwide most likely to change the course of business in the 90s. And Newsweek praised him as one of the Western world's most influential energy thinkers. Uh, Amory, welcome to Berkeley. Thanks for having me. Where were you born and raised? Washington, D.C. And, and uh, go lived, ahead, please. Lived, lived just outside there in Silver Spring, Maryland for eight years, and then gradually trickled up the coast, went to high school in Amherst, and then lived in Cambridge a few years, and then 14 years in England. And, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, profoundly. Uh, my sister, Julie, is a linguist, and I were uh, part of the adult conversation from the beginning. We were just small adults and there were a lot of interesting people discussing the affairs of the day. We were raised with the ideal of uh, helping make the world better uh, and uh, given lots of choices. So mm -hmm. I'd, I read voraciously, uh, being sick a lot in childhood. I was home reading most of the time and uh, ended up, uh, I think, much better equipped than I would have been through a conventional education. I'm actually a Harvard and Oxford dropout because uh, they wanted, well, Harvard wanted me to specialize too much and Oxford wouldn't let me do a doctorate in energy because it was two years before the oil embargo of 73 and they said, energy? What's that? <laughs> it's not an academic subject, is it? We have it a chair in it. Pick a real subject. So mm -hmm. I and, went and, and did it anyway. They now have a chair in it. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute, namely academic rigidity. But but I'm curious: it was it was it was that your reading was eclectic, and 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 cross disciplines. Is is that? Yeah, the, I mean my my formal education, such as it was, was uh, largely in physical sciences. But then I had a parallel track that went chronologically: uh, music, classics, math linguistics, some law, a little medicine, a lot of mountain photography. And then I started to diversify because in our line of work, we, you have to pick up a couple of new disciplines a year. Mm -hmm. And I, I figured out pretty early one of the great unwritten secrets that there's hardly any subject that a smart, motivated person can't learn as much about in six months as most people in the field know. Not all, of course, mm -hmm. but most. Uh, enough that you can rattle around in other people's turf and do some serious damage. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 what what is it that that uh, uh, is a is a key impetus here? That is, namely, you suddenly realize that you know a lot of, need to know something about some stuff that you don't know anything about, or is it just one thing leads you to another? One thing leads to another. Uh, all kinds of knowledge are useful. There's still a lot of stuff I, I, on which I have a you know, rapidly expanding mm -hmm. frontier of ignorance, but uh, after a while, as they say in linguistics, everything reminds you of something. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I think the world has way too many narrow specialists and not enough vision across boundaries. So mm -hmm. many of our problems are, are self-inflicted by narrow vision trying to do just one thing and not understanding connections. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know our guiding parable uh, about parachuting cats? No, no, please. Well, <clears throat> it's a essentially true story. I'm still nailing down some details in the archives, but in the 50s, 
The Dayak people in Borneo, uh, especially up in the Kalabit Highlands, had uh, malaria. The World Health Organization had a solution. They would spray DDT all over, which they did, and it killed the mosquitoes, so the malaria declined. So mm -hmm. far, so good. But there were side effects. For example, the roofs of people's houses started to fall down on their heads because the DDT had also killed tiny parasitic wasps that had previously controlled thatch-eating caterpillars. Mm. So <clears throat> the colonial government addressed this problem by giving people sheet metal roofs, but then folks were driven nuts by lack of sleep because of the din of the tropical rain on the tin roofs at night. Meanwhile, though, the DDT poison bugs were eaten by geckos, which were eaten by cats, and as the DDT built up in the food chain, it killed the cats, but without the cats, the rats flourished and multiplied, and soon the World Health Organization was threatened with potential outbreaks of typhus and sylvatic plague, which it itself would have created, and it therefore had to call up RAF Singapore and ask them to come conduct <coughs> Operation Cat Drop, parachuting large numbers of live cats into Borneo. So this nicely shows <coughs> that if you don't understand how things are connected, mm -hmm. quite often the cause of problems is solutions. Mm -hmm. Most of our problems are, are like that. So what we try to do at Rocky Mountain Institute, and really in my life's work, is to understand and harness hidden connections uh, so that you can solve or better still avoid a problem in a way that solves or avoids a lot of other problems as well without making new ones before somebody has to go mm -hmm. parachuting more cats. Yeah, and and <clears throat> one, I think the thrust of your analysis uh, uh, is that too often we focus on the little problem that is part of a chain. So you, you're suddenly presented with the problem, well, how do we fix the roofs in the middle chain? And you put the tin roofs in, and so nothing is really solved. Yeah, you're just uh, cre solve, or creating more problems or swapping one for another or making it somebody else's problem. The, 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 uh, I, I see a lot in your writing a kind of a holistic view, which, which you just mentioned. Is this, is this a, uh, are you at all interested in, in humanist studies, basically? I mean, does, does literature inform your sense of the whole at all? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, in, in cultural as in other affairs, I'm still wandering in the bewilderness, but, but uh, I do try to be broadly informed. And if I didn't do that, I couldn't possibly be effective or, or try to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked a little about your education, your disappointment with Harvard. You go to Oxford. You're at Oxford. Uh, you want to do energy studies. At the time is uh, 74. We're 71. 71. 71. Yeah. 71. Uh, talk a little about that time because what was coming was uh, the oil embargo uh, by the Middle Eastern states, and In you 73, wrote 73. Yeah. 73, right? Yeah. And and you wrote a very uh, perceptive article, uh, prophetic article in foreign affairs. Talk a little about that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> in the late 60s, I'd been reading the writings of John Holdren and others about the nexus, the tangle of population, environment, resource development, security issues, realizing we were headed for serious trouble with things like climate change and nuclear proliferation and oil dependence. Uh, and these were all interlinked. <clears throat> and it seemed to me obvious that energy was a kind of master key for unlocking many of these puzzles or for learning how to deal with other resource issues like water. Uh, <clears throat> and meanwhile, I was, uh, I transferred from Harvard to Oxford so that the administrators would get out of my hair. I had some in those days. Um, <laughs> In 60, we still have the administrators, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I had hair, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, in 67, uh, and uh, initially as a grad student at Maudlin College, Oxford, just through a series of coincidences of whom I knew that could help me get in. And that was great. And then I was running out of money again, uh, and my squash partner, Sudhir Anand, said, well, you know, I've got this nice thing at Merton called a senior scholarship that's expiring, so they'll advertise it again. Why don't you apply? It 
pays your expenses and a stipend, so I did. And halfway through the shortlist interview, discovered I was being interviewed for a much more exalted thing called a junior research fellowship, which I got and became a don. Um, and initially in Maudlin, I'd been doing theoretical physics, but I wasn't really a theoretician. And then I was trying to switch into biophysics and then realizing, you know, the old Stokely Carmichael line that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, the academic work I was doing was intellectually fascinating, but not <clears throat> terribly important. Uh, so I wanted to make more of a difference and meanwhile fell in with um, <clears throat> David Brower, the greatest conservationist of the 20th century, mm -hmm. through, of all things, mountain photography, which I'd been doing in North Wales with uh, Philip Powell Evans, the unsung great British landscape photographer. Uh, and um, ended up, we ended up together doing one of Dave's exhibit format books on the mountains of North Wales. <clears throat> that got me involved with him, so when Oxford didn't recognize energy as an academic subject, mm. uh, and uh, I couldn't find a way to do a doctorate in that. I resigned in 71, uh, partway through the fellowship, and uh, went to work for Dave as his British rep, initially for, I thought, a year or two. It turned out to be 10 years in London, although he had meanwhile left Friends of the Earth. And so I was living by my wits in London, cross-pollinating the energy grapevine across the Atlantic because mm -hmm. at that time the uh, technology leadership was more in the U.S., policy more in Europe. Uh, and they needed to talk to each other more. Um, and meanwhile, I'd come back and guide in the White Mountains every summer. And it, it, it worked quite well. And then eventually my <clears throat> then wife Hunter and I, married in 79, uh, moved back in 81, and uh, with, within a year we'd found some land to build on in Colorado and gather a handful of colleagues, mm -hmm. which soon got out of hand, but we mm -hmm. now have about 100. Uh, she left in 2002, and uh, Rocky Mountain Institute is now 26 years old and making a difference. Mm -hmm. and, and so, what, but what, what was the reception of this article that you wrote for Foreign Affairs? Oh, I well, that, that article actually came out of some concepts that first took shape on a Royal Dutch Shell blackboard in 75. They'd called me in around 73 uh, at the time of the oil embargo. Dennis Gabor, the uh, inventor of holography, said they should talk to me. Uh, and we got along well. They, were, they had, at that time, the best strategic planning capability in the world. So I found their planning methodology that Pierre Vaca had developed very valuable and educational. Uh, and I had some unusual ideas. I'd already, by the time of the embargo, written a book on energy, so I had a little head start. And <clears throat> was gradually realizing uh, through the early 70s that the whole problem had been misdefined as where do we get more energy, more of any kind from any source at any price. But people don't actually want, you know, barrels of sticky black goo or mm. lumps of coal or raw kilowatt hours. They want the services the energy provides, like hot showers, cold beer, mobility, comfort. And it seemed to make more sense to start at that end of the problem by asking what tasks or end uses do we want the energy for and how much energy of what kind or quality at what scale from what source will do that job in the cheapest way. So this end use least cost uh, question turned out to be a very fruitful way to look at energy and a lot of other things and indeed uh, in 75, 76 I wrote this article that ended up in Foreign Affairs and then a book a year later, Soft Energy Paths, and uh, it still reads pretty well. Mm -hmm. it, it laid out what happens, what answer do you get if you ask that different question and uh, you end up using energy far more productively. We've already more than doubled our energy efficiency since 75 at a big profit. Uh, and you end up shifting supply to more diverse, dispersed, renewable sources that provide the right kind for the job. Uh, <clears throat> and that revolution is now well underway, too. Uh, it, it was delayed by policy meddling for 20-odd years, but uh, 
finally it's happening in the market. Uh, in fact, the developments are really revolutionary and, and very few people realize the revolution already happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm curious, Before let, we'll talk about the Rocky Mountain Institute in a, in a moment, but uh, uh, in, because I think that uh, uh, organization is really critical to the way you view the problems of the world, but, but I'm curious, uh, for students might be interested in, in classifying you. You're a consultant, a physical scientist, an engineer. And, and well, what, what does it take? Well, you re can answer that. Recovering physicist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I'm curious is what, what, what are the skills do you see that are really important for doing the kind of out-of-the-box thinking that you do? The same ones that I look for in people I hire. I, I want people who are literate, numerate, uh, self-starting or self-propelled, uh, fun, intensely curious, have a vision across boundaries, are passionate about our mission, and have a high tolerance of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, quite a number of skills, but necessary if you're going to think out of the box. Uh, yeah, and realize there is no box. Yeah. Uh, the, so I, I don't hire by discipline. I hire mm -hmm. by aptitude. I look for all-round athletes. Mm -hmm. and, and so w frustrated at uh, at Harvard, uh, at Oxford, you, you move to the U.S., you start uh, this institute. What did you see that institute being able to do uh, uh, that you couldn't do in the, these other settings? Well, my then wife Hunter and I thought uh, we could be more effective with a handful of colleagues than just mom and pop. And Dave Brower was gradually getting into an untenable position with his board at Friends of the Earth that he, as he had earlier at the Sierra Club. Uh, he used to say if you're an environmentalist and have uh, balance in your bank account, it means you haven't realized the urgency of the situation. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so it was obvious he was going to be forced out and probably we would too. So we started to think, well, what a sort of institutional home uh, could we devise? There weren't at the time companies or government agencies or other groups that we found very attractive and eventually we came up with the notion of starting our own which we did with ten thousand bucks out of our back pocket and just grew it from there uh, and uh, you know I said oh horrors administrivia and Hunter said well don't worry I've been running tree people for Andy Lipkus for some years so I know how to do that and you just get the ideas and do the research and quality control. So that worked for a long time and gradually we became more institutional and now fully so because in March of 07 we finally got a real CEO, Michael Potts, who's a tech entrepreneur. So I was then able belatedly uh, to move up to chairman and chief scientist so I can just do uh, mission stewardship and evolution, thought leadership, special projects, uh, cultural transmission and mentoring, strategic influence, uh, rainmaking, Rolodex, all, all the stuff that goes with being elder, although not yet venerable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if you had to give a short mission statement for your institute, what, what is it? We're actually in the process of rewording it, but it's currently to foster the efficient and restorative use of resources to make the world secure, just, prosperous, and life-sustaining. Mm -hmm. I won't give you a sneak preview of what we're coming up with, which I think is even niftier, but says the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the short version is we uh, create abundance by design. Mm -hmm. And so, so then the, the, question, uh, the, the question becomes, uh, obviously you think ideas matter. And uh, the, so, so how do you make them effective in the world? We implement our ideas largely in mindful markets uh, <clears throat> by a, a, an unusual variety of techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, 
things like uh, institutional acupuncture. We figure out where the business logic and what ought to happen is congested and not flowing properly. We stick mm. needles in carefully selected sites to get mm. it flowing. This works very well. Uh, <clears throat> we have pretty good convening power because we're fiercely independent, known for saying honestly exactly what we think and backing it up with, with good scholarship. So uh, we're widely regarded in, in industry and military and can pull together people that need to talk to each other as kind of an honest broker. Uh, we uh, use uh, architectural uh, charrette process, which is an intensive roundtable transdisciplinary design workshop with very ambitious deliverables. We've applied that to redesigning hundreds of buildings, industries, vehicles, you name it, just about anything. So we, and, and we have really a quite extensive toolkit. We don't try to take our work to scale by turning into a huge uh, consulting firm or whatever. We, we try to ally with powerful partners who already have those capabilities mm. and need our content, uh, which we're happy to have them brand and spread. And uh, <clears throat> we've evolved a rather unusual uh, hybrid mechanism as an entrepreneurial nonprofit that's had, in 26 years, 11 different revenue models, 10 of them entrepreneurial, and they've all mm. worked. Most of them are still going on, including five for-profit spinoffs. So much of our revenue actually comes from private sector consultancy to carry out our mission. This creates very rapid learning with a smart, highly motivated partner. Uh, <clears throat> it creates also teachable case studies and competitive pressure for emulation. That is, we help early adopters get so conspicuously hmm. successful uh, with resource efficiency and natural capitalism that their rivals are forced by competitive pressure to follow suit or lose market share. Mm -hmm. you, you told the uh, uh, Manchester Guardian, it, it was a snappy quote and a list of snappy quotes, I'm not an environmentalist, I'm a cultural repairman. Uh, was <laughs> was that just a, <laughs> a, a singer for the moment? Or, but it, it no, sounds it's, like it's that, it, it's true. Yeah, explain that, explain what that means. Well, we're trying to help things work better. Uh, and RMI is not an environmental group. Uh, it's a think and do tank uh, mm -hmm. that uh, advances resource efficiency because uh, that, create, that turns scarcity into abundance and relieves a lot of the basic problems of uh, environment development, security, and prosperity simultaneously and without compromise. Mm -hmm. So we, we think it's a, not exactly a magic elixir, but pretty close. It solves lots of problems at once and doesn't make more. You, you in, in acting in the world, so to speak, with ideas, you, uh, uh, you had a choice and you identify that choice, namely do you work with business, do you work with government, do you work with the environmental movement? I'm sure you work with all of them. You work with but, everybody. But, but, but your, your, your main focus has been with uh, consulting with business yep. is, is that and, and and why was that? Did you see the possibilities for doing this cultural re repair work? Uh, that that was a better environment to do this. Uh, working with business has been a main focus for 35 years because it, it was clear even then that in in the evolving tripolar world where the the foci of power and action are in uh, the private sector, civil society, and government all interacting. Uh, government, at least at a national level, is typically the least effective of those, and in our country particularly, it's been dreadfully gridlocked for a long time, and the process of forming its policy is pretty corrupt. Uh, so why not work with the more effective sectors, particularly business in its coevolution with civil society? Uh, which could be uh, anywhere from cooperative to adversarial, but it, it's, they form a, a, a tight ecosystem. And uh, we found businesses in general extraordinarily dynamic. It has, of course, its own 
hang-ups and, and inertias like, like every institution, but there is a lot of leadership, top-down, bottom-up, every which way, that can be harnessed uh, in business to do extraordinary things quickly. It's, it's, other than perhaps the military, it's about the only really effective institution we have that can do big, difficult things quickly. Uh, it, it's interesting that that uh, in in your life's work, you you've often, uh, and I want to be careful with my terms here, and you can jump on me, but but you, it's as if you 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 were perceived as a Cassandra, when in fact you were a prophet, basically, and and I I, I think uh, that it it's fascinating that that you uh, identified a vehicle whereby you could make things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, but many people argue that uh, it, when we're looking at the environmental problems that capitalism is part of the problem and not the solution. But, but what you're, you're really saying is that you, you can start at the micro level. You have to have the right theory and the right way to think about engineering processes and changing those processes, but that you can work at the, at the level of the firm, but through the market there will be imitation and competition will, which will force a general adoption of what. Is, is that a fair statement of, pretty, of the way you see it? Pretty close. I mean, I, I, I'm certainly not a market fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think markets can solve all problems. Markets make a splendid servant, a bad master, and a worse religion. <laughs> and if you try to substitute markets for ethics, politics, faith, you get in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our, our country is just starting uh, to reverse that pendulum swing. Uh, <clears throat> but um, business is very good at what it does. Markets are very good at what they do. We've invented probably 20 ways to make markets in saved resources, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, really simple ideas, like in New England, you can bid megawatt saved electricity into the supply auction. Mm -hmm. And of course you win, because efficiency is cheaper than, mm -hmm. than producing more electricity. Then you get the money up front with which to do the savings, and you have money left over, and everybody saves money in emissions. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, the toolkit we've evolved is very much, uh, but not exclusively, led by business for profit. We've also devised a lot of innovative public policies to help support and not distort the business logic. I think government has a very important role, but it should mm -hmm. steer, not row. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'd like it to steer in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But then I work mainly with the rowers mm -hmm. to improve their technique. For example, we've figured out, and now demonstrated in 29 sectors, how to get expanding, not diminishing returns to investments in energy and resource savings. That is, how to make uh, very big savings, even factor 10 savings, cheaper than small or no savings. Cheaper up front. This mm -hmm. always surprises the economists. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, uh, when, if you look at your career, uh, it's very clear that you, your, your uh, analysis your theorizing really gives one a long-term view. And often, uh, uh, the current situation is not ready for the long-term view. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Is, is that, has that been frustrating, well, the extent to which uh, it, it really takes time? Uh, I'm not talking about the particular redesign of a particular company, but rather the long-term vision that you have and which you call natural capitalism, which we'll talk about in a minute. Well. What were the changes that my colleagues and I are trying to make take typically a half century or so to come to full mm -hmm. flower, uh, and this requires relentless patience mm -hmm. and meticulous attention to detail. But you see a lot of progress every day, uh, which, which is of course encouraging, uh, <clears throat> and we don't set um, abstract long-term goals that don't have short-term practical steps. Uh, hmm. uh, that is, we're intently focused on how to get there from here, not just this far-off mm -hmm. vision, because we work in a spirit of applied hope, which is not the same as theoretical hope and not the same as mere glandular optimism. Mm -hmm. 
Let, let's talk about uh, uh, your your vision in natural capitalism. Uh, there, uh, uh, let me show the the book, and and we will also direct people to your website uh, uh, shortly. Uh, Help us understand, let's walk through some of the arguments there. And I think you start with the notion that, that where capitalism has failed uh, and needs to be redirected is really in its, the valuation that it places on natural capital. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, capitalism, in a way, has succeeded all too well uh, <clears throat> in half of its task. Capitalism is conventionally defined as the uh, productive use of and reinvestment in capital. But what's capital? Mm -hmm. uh, industrial capitalism, as we have known it, productively uses and reinvests in only physical and financial capital, that is, money and goods. But it ignores and often liquidates two even more important kinds, namely people and nature, human capital and natural capital. Without people, there's no economy. Without nature, there are no people. This is a rather material omission. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out if you productively use and reinvest in all four forms of capital, if you play with a full deck, you make more money, have for more fun, and do more good. Mm -hmm. So natural capitalism, uh, which uh, Hunter and I formulated with our senior author, Paul Hawken, uh, is a, a new way of doing business as if nature and people were properly valued, but without needing to know or signal their value. It's not about internalizing environmental costs, uh, but it, it has four operational elements. Um, the first is uh, radical resource efficiency, wringing lots more work out of the energy, minerals, water, topsoil, everything we borrow from the planet. Uh, second, making things the way nature does, with closed loops, no waste, and no toxicity. Third, adopting a business model that rewards those two shifts by rewarding both producers and customers for the same thing, namely doing more and better with less for longer. And fourth, you reinvest some of the resulting profits back into the kinds of capital you're shortest of, particularly nature. Mm -hmm. Together, those interlocking principles turn out to confer stunning competitive advantage and help, of course, attract, uh, retain, and motivate the best people, which is what business competition is at, at, at root about. And, and this is really not a novel set of ideas. It rests on very orthodox economic concepts and historical experience. I mean, in, in the, if you go back to the roots of the first industrial revolution in the 18th century in England, uh, just oversimplify a bit, there weren't enough weavers to make enough cloth for most people to afford. But if you'd come into Parliament around 1750 and said, don't worry, I know how to solve this problem, we'll just make weavers a hundred times more productive, Mm -hmm. Nobody would have understood this concept, let alone thought it was possible. Mm -hmm. But it's what happened, and, and you know, soon as technological innovators teamed up with profit-maximizing capitalists, uh, <clears throat> you had uh, a Lancashire spinner that could produce the cloth that previously had required a couple of hundred weavers. So we started spreading this through the economy, and soon you had affordable mass goods, purchasing power, middle class, and, and ultimately all the artifacts we see around us as the hallmarks of an advanced industrial civilization. Now, to, to summarize then the history, uh, we hadn't enough, we, we, we had, um, we had uh, scarce people, uh, relative scarcity of people, not enough people to exploit seemingly boundless nature. Mm -hmm. So we made people a hundred times more productive. Well now the logic is the same, but the pattern of scarcity has reversed. Mm -hmm. We now have abundant people and scarce nature. So mm -hmm. now it's not uh, people but nature we need to be using four, ten, a hundred times more productively. And I, I think that's an idea everybody can get behind, particularly because it's very profitable. Efficiency is cheaper than the resources it saves. Therefore, for example, it's 
profitable, not costly, to protect the climate because efficiency is cheaper than fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, look at a, a concrete example because what you're, uh, you have a very interesting example in both the book and in the article in the Harvard uh, Review uh, about a carpet maker uh, and and uh, basically it, it, it comes down to rethinking design, rethinking our notion of a product, uh, looking at not having a product, namely a carpet on your office floor, but the services that provide that. Talk, talk mm -hmm. about that because it, it, it's really, you're taken aback by how, if you look at the whole picture, you, you, you really have to t look at the world in a new way. Yeah, uh, most offices are still carpeted with broad loom, big wide rolls of stuff. And every 10 or 20 years it starts to look pretty awful. So you have to shut down the office, move everybody out, roll up the partly worn carpet, which is made of oil, send it to landfill where it sits for 10 or 20,000 years, uh, hmm. and lay down a new carpet, move back in, maybe get poisoned by the fumes from the carpet glue. This is really pretty dumb when you think about it because mm -hmm. you never wanted a to own a carpet in the first place. What you wanted was to walk on it and look at it. So Ray Anderson and Interface uh, went beyond just the first principle of natural capitalism, uh, eliminating waste and wringing more work out of his resources. He did pretty well with that, hundreds of millions of dollars extra profit. Uh, I think out different materials to, to yeah, and, and already the company's cut its greenhouse gas emissions 82 percent while growing the business. It has the most oil independent cost structure in the industry. It's doing really well with this mm -hmm. approach. But he said, uh, oh, wait a minute, let's invent a new kind of carpet uh, that has uh, essentially no waste, no toxicity. You can remake it into itself with no loss of quality uh, and it, it has good aesthetics and acoustics and durability and so on and takes a lot less energy and material to make. Uh, but then he said, let's um, deliver it as carpet tiles, not as broad loom. And we could even do it through a service lease. So we lease you a floor covering service hmm. and every month the little elves come in the night and remove only the worn carpet tiles to be recycled into new ones. And they put down fresh ones so you have an always fresh looking carpet, but there's no disruption to your operation. And then you only need to replace about a fifth of the carpet tiles because the rest of them are in places you're not walking. So you save another factor five on top of the factor 20 something from uh, greater durability and less materials intensity. And then when you, so, so you, you've saved about, you know, 97, 98% of the flow of stuff to have a nice looking carpet. And when you actually remanufacture it, you'd end up saving 99.9% .9 or so. So imagine that you're the old kind of carpet maker and you're trying to compete with this new kind. Mm -hmm. So you're using 10 times more capital, a thousand times more oil, uh, and by the way, your competitor is leasing a floor covering service. That's a tax deductible net operating lease. It's actually a financial product. Whereas you're selling square yards of carpet, which is an idle balance sheet item doing you no good. Uh, it's pretty obvious who's going to win that competition. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, in the event, there were some, there was one technical problem and there were some institutional challenges with the marketing on the particular product I described. But the concept is perfectly sound, and this so-called solutions economy business model is taking over pretty quickly in areas like chemicals, where Dow, for example, instead of selling you a solvent, leases you a dissolving service. So the more trips they can put the solvent through with different customers and not lose much each time, the cheaper the dissolving service becomes, cheaper for you, cheaper for them, more profitable for everybody, and the the more elegant frugality they can achieve in using the solvent molecules, the more money you both make. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very subtle and powerful concept uh, to lease the service people want from the good rather than selling the good. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it gets into areas as 
obvious as, as Schindler liking to lease you a vertical transportation service instead of selling you an elevator. Mm -hmm. Then the more durable and efficient the elevator gets, the more money you both make. Mm -hmm. now, now, how do you envision this model changing the world? You just suggested that when a competitor looks at what's going on in the other operation, they, they seem to have a losing proposition. Well, it's is happening it, already. I mean, it, look, it, look at the Zipcar Flexcar model for personal mobility. Mm -hmm. your, your car, your second biggest household asset, is parked 96% of the mm -hmm. time. It just sits there eating interest and parking fees. Well, if you uh, arrange instead to have the car of your choice available by the hour, and then you leave it at any convenient place, or in some countries they'll deliver it to you and pick it up afterwards. Uh, this means you can, you know, have a, a four-by to haul drywall on Wednesday and a sports car to pick up your hunting on Saturday, and you don't need to own either one of them. Mm -hmm. And the business model works for the provider because there's diversity of need and very low asset utilization by each customer. Well, it's also great for society. It's a lot cheaper and you take about half the vehicle miles off the road to provide uh, the same or better mobility. How, how do you see the, the present uh, uh, financial crisis impacting on your set of ideas? It would seem to offer a great opportunity because what uh, had, the old system had going for it was waste, really, a, a system mm -hmm. built to produce waste and to uh, not think about the, um, the natural capital or the people capital in the way you're talking about. So, so is this, is this uh, an opportunity? Are things, in a way, so serious that it, it, it's going to fast forward the time that uh, people see uh, uh, the changes that we need? Well, at RMI, you know, we're, we're practitioners, not theorists. We do solutions, not problems. We do transformation, not incrementalism. And times of crisis like this are wonderful transformational mm -hmm. opportunities. Uh, if, if, if what you want is a world without waste, or want or war, then all the principles of natural capitalism are just what you need. Mm -hmm. And the more hard pressed you are personally or in your business to meet your goals, the more elegant frugality and abundance by design you need. Uh, and the better you need business models that reward provider and customer interests together, that, that align those interests. So I, I think. Uh, this could be a great opportunity. Just as a small example, I do a lot of work in the automotive industry. And uh, and you had designed a car, actually. That yeah. Well, I figured out in 91 how to do factor three to six more efficient, uncompromised mm -hmm. cars at about the same cost. And uh, the industry wasn't uh, ready, in particular GM wasn't ready culturally at that time to work seriously with outsiders, especially a little nonprofit. So we open sourced the idea in 93 so nobody could patent it, got everybody mm -hmm. fighting over it. And by 2000, the industry had committed over $10 billion to this line of development, which was more than a 3,000-fold multiplier for our R&D investment. Um, and then we've done a couple of spin-offs to provide a manufacturing solution and now a plug-in hybrid uh, commercialization. Uh, <clears throat> but. Uh, I think now that the this tsunami of creative destruction is washing over Detroit, uh, minds are opening quite mm. wonderfully. You know, the, the competition is changing the managers or their minds, whichever comes first. And uh, they now are starting to realize that incrementalism is the high-risk strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine you're in the sumo ring with the world champion sumo wrestler Toyota-san. Do you keep training to try to get a little faster and stronger than Toyota-san, or do you maybe halfway through just quietly switch the game to Aikido and not tell them? This might be more promising. Mm -hmm. you, you're something of a pessimist when it comes to government, although you've worked a lot with the Pentagon. And I, as I, I, I go through some of the stuff that you've written, I have the sense that you, you worry about subsidies, that, for example, in, in the soft energy path, uh, subsidies can be a problem 
in the sense that in the short term, the government giveth, but in the long term, it, it takes away. So, so I'm curious, in the present crisis, we, we're in, talking now about the automobile industry. We're in a situation where the government has already given $25 billion, is promising another $15 uh, billion to the autumn. How, how would you like to see things come together so that the kind of natural capitalism ideas that you have on the table would be implemented without government uh, being uh, uh, an obstruction in the path? Well, I think a, an interesting bit of history to look at is how at the start of World War II, the automakers who were then making four million cars a year, uh, switched completely in six months to making no cars, but to making the Jeeps, tanks, planes, munitions, the mm -hmm. stuff that won the war. Uh, if you take seriously, as I do, the security, prosperity, and climate implications of our oil dependence, uh, the economic collapse of automaking in, in this country is a wonderful opportunity to mm -hmm. do something more in the spirit of that wartime mm -hmm. urgency in retooling, retraining, rejigging that industry to use its, its wonderful skills to produce the kinds of vehicles we need, which can be big, uh, sporty, but also super efficient. And I'm, I'm not talking about incremental gains or even what's hmm. in the present law. I'm talking about what the market and other conditions on us require. Uh, factor three to six improvement is straightforward. At least factor three improvement doesn't cost any more mm -hmm. uh, with modern techniques. We already have lightweighting and electrification revolutions starting in the industry, but they are normally assumed to come in slowly because of all of the constraints on how little money we have to retool with. Well, if we're going to have to rebuild this industry anyway to get it back on its feet, let's jump to the best stuff because that's what <laughs> foreign competitors are going to be bringing to us anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really have a choice whether we're going to keep importing efficient cars to make, uh, to, to, uh, to save oil, or whether we're going to make efficient cars and import neither the oil nor the cars. And mm -hmm. there's one or two million jobs hanging in the balance. So, so the elements here of, of really moving forward on some of these ideas that we, we have climate change uh, and the, the energy crisis coming together at a time of a really serious economic collapse. Well, the, what we need to do in energy to solve our economic and uh, security and climate problems are all the same thing. Mm -hmm. You have exactly the same set of actions to solve all those problems at once. There's no comp compromise or trade-off. And you said earlier I'm pessimistic about government. Not, not natively so. I, I mm -hmm. have a great admiration for many of the institutions and individuals in government. Uh, and there is often very effective government, particularly at a, more of a state or local level. At, a, at the federal level, we have the best government money can buy uh, because we've been proceeding for some years on a one dollar, one vote system. Uh, I think there's a whiff of change in the air mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we can't go on this way. But you know, Churchill said you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing once they've exhausted all other alternatives. We must be pretty near the bottom of the list by now. <laughs> uh, it, it, let, let's take the example of nuclear power, because that's a case where uh, uh, private capital, you point out, has, has not put, e put its money on the table for building <coughs> more nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. There isn't uh, a you, penny of private investment at risk in any new nuclear plant in the world other than that of the vendors. And whereas there has been a lot of private capital in, in, down the south energy yeah. path. But, but the question is, are, are you- $148 billion of, say, of clean energy uh, private capital last year worldwide. Are you, are you worried that government will make the, the wrong choice? Uh, in this regard, I'm, I'm trying to understand, because uh, you have a set of ideas, we have the, the moment of opportunity, I, I, I want to anticipate the way things could go wrong so they won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, nuclear is 
already died of an incurable attack of market forces. You know, 100 plus percent new subsidies in the U.S. have failed to elicit a penny of private investment. That was before the capital market went away. Mm -hmm. And I think now that it has gone away, it's even less possible uh, to imagine financing a 10 or 15 billion dollar uh, plants that are big, slow, lumpy, therefore high-risk investments that are guaranteed obsolete before they can be built. That's true not just of nuclear, but of coal plants, gas plants, any kind of big thermal plant is already uncompetitive. Uh, it's too late to build those, and the market is rejecting them rapidly. I mean, just in 2007, uh, <coughs> the U.S. or China or Spain added more wind power than the world added nuclear power, and the U.S. added more wind power led by Texas, then we've added coal plants the last five years put together. Uh, I don't know what part of the story <clears throat> uh, anyone who takes markets seriously doesn't get, but you know the last full year's data we have, 2006, nuclear worldwide added less capacity than photovoltaics did, a tenth what wind power did, 30 or 40 times less than micropower did. And that doesn't even count electric mm -hmm. savings. Altogether, the big thermal power plants we're told are so indispensable are now minority market share. They're providing less than half of the world's new electrical services because they cost too much and they have too much financial risk. So the revolution's already happened. Sorry if you missed it. And <clears throat> governments can have, regardless of their level of nuclear enthusiasm, only as many nuclear plants as they can force the taxpayers to buy because investors aren't that dumb. Mm -hmm. So what do you worry about in terms of <clears throat> not seizing this opportunity? Well, if we spend our money on the wrong stuff, we make all our problems worse. You know, mm -hmm. for example, if, if you buy a new nuclear plant, you're, you're going to get about 2 to 11 odd times less carbon displacement to protect the climate, and you'll get it 20 to 40 times slower than if you'd bought efficiency and micropower instead, mm -hmm. the market winners. Uh, in fact, if you buy nuclear instead of efficiency, you will thereby cause more carbon to be released than if you'd spent the same money buying a new coal plant. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> this, this uh, little problem with not picking the cheapest, fastest method of protecting the climate has gone largely unnoticed, and the nuclear industry is desperately keen that you not notice it, mm -hmm. uh, because they say, well, we're carbon free. Well, that's not good enough. You have to be also cheaper and faster than other ways to protect the climate, and they're not. Uh, so I, I think uh, there's this prevalent myth that uh, energy policy is like a Chinese restaurant menu, you know, the, the big old kind where you, you select one thing from column A and one from column <laughs> B and so on until everybody who contributed a lot to your campaign is happy. Well. If you actually order that way in a Chinese restaurant, you'll probably have indigestion and possibly uh, bankruptcy. And if you actually spend all your money on, on the delicacies, you may not get enough rice to avoid going away hungry. So you really have to choose dis judiciously, not indiscriminately, from our big menu of energy choices and pick the, the right combination of best buys that will solve your problems quick as fast as cheapest. We have a lot of other things we need to spend money on and energy doesn't need to be one of them. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I, I think more broadly we, we need a trans-ideological and in some ways a deeply conservative approach to energy policy. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would love to see is for all ways to save or produce energy to compete fairly at honest prices regardless of which kind they are, what technology they use, uh, where they are, how big they are, or who owns them. Let's see who's not in favor of that. Hmm. Well, <laughs> let, me, let me venture a prediction. It's going to be the incumbents mm -hmm. who have paid a lot of money to install large troughs shoveled full of public money, and they have their snouts in the trough and are very happy with this arrangement. Mm -hmm. One, one final question, uh, looking back at your career, how would you advise uh, students to prepare for their future? Hmm. Fearlessly, adventurously, and with complete disregard to any suggestions about how to structure their curriculum. Uh, <clears throat> they'll probably do a lot more good 
uh, if they've uh, studied chemical engineering, cultural anthropology, and Chinese history uh, than if they are deep and narrow. Uh, <clears throat> And if your advisor raises eyebrows looking at your proposed course of study and says, I don't see what this has to do with that, then you're probably on the right track. <laughs> on that note, I, I want to uh, thank you for coming to the campus to be the, uh, the Weinstock lecturer later today. And thank you for taking the time to have this conversation. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.